lesson tonight on Jesus' authority to judge from John chapter 5. Tonight, I I just I'm amazed at God's goodness, and I'm honored that the Kenya and the committee invited me. There are outstanding preachers in the brotherhood. And, uh, the invitation was extended to me, and I'm honored to be here. And I'm thankful. I trust that what I'm going to share with you tonight will accomplish at least one of four things. Number one, I'm going to encourage you. Number two, hopefully, it'll be thought provoking that you'll leave here thinking of how you can serve God better in your particular congregation, how you can glorify God in your thoughts as well as in your deeds. I hope maybe they'll uplift you. Maybe there's someone here, you're going through something that your faith has is not what it used to be. Maybe tonight, even from this lesson, maybe something will be said to uplift you. But most of all, I hope what I'm saying will be biblically sound. Is that all right? Yes. You see, I didn't come here to share with you my thoughts. I didn't come here to share with you my feelings. I've come to share with you from the greatest book ever written, this book by me. Now, this is my first trip here, and usually when I speak at a place my first time, I'm extremely nervous. So I've been preaching for 40 years, but I'm nervous tonight. Now, you're in trouble when I get nervous. I don't know when to quit. So we may get out of here by midnight. But I hope that it will be encouraging to you. If you have your copy of God's Word, turn to John chapter 5. In John chapter 5, there are three things that I want to share with you from this text. John 5, verse 25 through verse 30. The first thing we want to talk about from this chapter that I want to share with you, my first point, is to give you a quick overview of the setting of the text in chapter 5. You see, in order for you to understand point 2, you need to understand point 1. And so point 1 would be an overview of the setting in chapter 5 of the text of John 5, verse 25 through verse 30. And then the second point I want to make tonight is that setting caused Jesus to address these Jewish leaders. And he entertained four truths that I want to share with you. Four truths about his authority that you and I need to be aware of. And then that will lead us into my third and final point. After he deals with these four truths, I want to ask you a timely question that hopefully will cause you to think about your relationship with the God that we serve in heaven. If you remember nothing else I'm going to say tonight, I want you to remember this. God loves you. Amen. If you remember nothing else, God loves you. And God wants you in heaven. And I'm thankful again to the, to the committee that's planned this lectureship for our spiritual feast to help us to cultivate within us a passion to want to serve the God that loves us so much. Romans 5, verse 8. God commends his love towards us. And that while we were what? Yet sinners. God didn't wait to say I'm John got his life right to start loving me. God loved me even while I was what? A sinner. And God loved you while you were a sinner. And God wants you to be saved. So what can we learn from the Word of God that will help us to improve our relationship with this God that wants us in heaven? And that's what we have in this book. And I want to share a portion of that with you from John chapter 5. And so let's go with our point number one, the setting. So if you have your copy of God's Word, turn to John chapter 5, the fifth chapter. John describes in this book the second year of Jesus' ministry. Prior to chapter 5, most of all of Jesus' ministry was in the region of Galilee. And now he has shifted his ministry from the region of Galilee to the region of Judea. And while in Judea, particularly he goes to the city of Jerusalem. 
And if you look in John chapter 5, Jesus, or John rather, mentions an unnamed feast that Jesus is attending in Jerusalem. Biblical scholars recognize that this feast is the Passover. And while Jesus is in the city of Jerusalem, he starts walking through the city, and it is the day of the Passover. It's the Sabbath day. And, and notice, when he gets near the pool called the, the, the Sheep Gate, he sees a man who has been paralyzed, if you notice the text, for 30 eight years. Jesus does something. He heals this man and then he gives him some instruction in verse number nine. Rise, take up your bed and walk. Now I want you to remember this occurs on the Sabbath day. The healing of the paralyzed man causes the Jewish leaders to become upset with Jesus. They're upset with Jesus because Jesus has just done something that he, according to them, didn't have the authority to do. He told the man that he just healed to take his bed and walk. Now look at verse 9 again. I'm about to tell you something that's not in your translation, that's not in your text, but it's in mine. Now listen to me. In my translation, the Bible tells us the name of this man. His name is a good Jewish name. His name is Leroy. So I want you to remember that. <laughs> Leroy is told by Jesus, Leroy, take up your bed and walk. And when the Jewish leaders heard that Leroy was carrying his bed, they had a meeting with Leroy. They informed Leroy that it is a Sabbath and no person has the authority to carry his or her bed unless they gave that authority to him. So they want to know, Leroy, who gave you the authority to carry your bed? Look at verse 11. In verse 11, Leroy says, he who made me well, who, he who healed me said to me, take up your bed and walk. Their response is, who is the man who said, take up your bed and walk? Leroy says, I don't know who the man is. But after a period of investigation, the Jewish leaders discovered that it was Jesus who healed Leroy. And so they're upset with Jesus. Number one, because he told Leroy to take his bed, or take up his bed and walk. But there's a second reason that they're upset with him with Jesus is because Jesus heals Leroy on the Sabbath day. And according to them in verse 16, Jesus had just done something that's worthy of death. And from that moment, they began to spend a great deal of their energy and time seeking to kill Jesus. So it's important that you understand what's going on. Jesus has started his ministry in the region of Judea. The hostility and antagonism against Jesus is increasing. And Jesus has a confrontation with these Jewish leaders, the Sanhedrin. And Jesus does something. And that brings me to my second point, which is the heart of this lesson. And that is Jesus addresses four truths with these Jewish leaders. He addresses four truths with these Jewish leaders who have questioned his authority. Look at verse number 17. In verse number 17, here's the first truth that he addresses with them. He tells them what he didn't do. Jesus began to tell them what he didn't do, and that is he didn't violate the Sabbath day. He didn't violate the law of of Moses. Notice in verse number 17, he says, my father is not limited by any day. My father can do good not only on Sunday, but Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even the Sabbath day. God is not limited by any day, and nor am I limited by any day. 
it's all right to do good if you're doing it to glorify God any day, even on the Sabbath day. And so Jesus says, I didn't violate the Jewish law. Turn to Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse number 12. And Matthew chapter 12 and verse number 12, Matthew describes a situation where Jesus has a confrontation with the Pharisees. The Pharisees have accused Jesus and his apostles of violating the Sabbath day. But notice what Jesus tells them, that his apostles, and he, they were in compliance with God's will, the law. They didn't violate the Sabbath day. Why? Look at Matthew 12, verse 12. For he says, it is lawful. Do you see that? It is lawful to do good on the Sabbath day. You can do good if you're doing God's will on any day. And my disciples were doing good. And what we were doing was good. And it's all right. And so, going back to John chapter 5 and verse number 17, Jesus says, we didn't violate the Sabbath day. Because according to God's law, according to the law of Moses, it's always good to do good, even if it's on the Sabbath day. Right. Now back up to Matthew chapter 11. In Matthew chapter 11, look at verse number 5. In Matthew chapter 11, John the Baptist is incarcerated. He's in jail. And he sends two of his disciples to Jesus. He hears about the great work that Jesus is doing. And so he sends two of his disciples to Jesus. And he says, tell me, Jesus, are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? And Jesus sent these words back to John the Baptist. Look at verse number 5. He says, John, paraphrasing, the proof of my Messiahship is when the blind see, when the lame walk, when the lepers are cleansed, my proof of my ministry that I am sent from God is that miracles are done. And so what Jesus was doing in John chapter 5 proves his Messiahship. What Jesus had done in John chapter 5 by healing Leroy was not a violation of the Jewish law. It was proving that he was God's son. Now, what I want you to see before we continue, drop down to verse 39. Look at John chapter 5, verse 39. We're going to look at that verse several times. And John chapter 5, verse 39, you know what Jesus told the Jewish leaders? You search the scriptures, but you miss the point. You search the scriptures, but you don't even know the scriptures. Because if you knew the scriptures, then you would know who I am. Amen. I am the Son of God. I'm not just any man. I am the Son of God. You remember that verse. Well, let's go back to John chapter 5, verse number 17. And John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, I didn't violate the Jewish law. The problem is this. Over the years. Your rabbis Amen. have added to God's law. Your, your rabbis have modified God's law. Your rabbis have done something they didn't have authority to do. And so what I've done is not violated the Jewish law. I violated one of your traditions. Amen. You see, Jesus didn't violate the Sabbath day. He did what God sent him to the earth to do, and that was to prove that he's a son of God. Now, if Jesus had violated the Jewish law, if he had violated the Sabbath day, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2, look at verse number 22, and other passages in the Bible would be in error. Because Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, that Jesus did no sin, and neither was God nor deceit found in his mouth. If Jesus had violated the Jewish law, he would have sinned, and he would have not been that perfect Lamb of God that John said in John 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Jesus took the opportunity. When he had this confrontation, when he had this co confrontation with these Jewish leaders, he said, let me tell you, number one, what I didn't do. That's the first truth. I didn't violate the Jewish law. Now look at verse 24. Here's a second truth. He said, it's not enough that you need to know that I didn't violate the Jewish law. You need to know who I am. So let me tell you who I am. Look at verse 24. He who hears my words 
and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life. What are you saying, Jesus? Jesus telling them that whosoever, I want you to remember that word, whether you be Jew or Gentile, whosoever, the day is coming, the time is coming, Jesus telling these Jewish leaders something they didn't want to hear. The day is coming that whosoever put their trust in me will enjoy two blessings in the text. Look at John chapter, verse 24. Look at John 5, verse 24. They shall enjoy two blessings. What's the first blessing? Hope. What's hope? Expectation. What's expectation? Of eternal life. Those who put their trust in Jesus but have the hope and thanks be to God, amen? amen, that we can live tonight, and if I don't make it back to, to uh, Henderson, Tennessee, or Jackson, Tennessee, that's okay. I'm living in hope. And that's what Jesus is trying to get these Jewish leaders to understand. You need to understand, I didn't violate the Jewish law. You said that you need to understand who I am. I am somebody, and I'm gonna share with you tonight who he is. But Jesus says, if you obey my words, if you obey and believe in him who has sent me, you can live in hope and the hope of eternal life. And what's the second thing you can enjoy? Look at verse 24. On the day of judgment, you'll be able to stand. You see, everybody's not going to be able to stand on the day of judgment. But those who put their trust in me, those who obey my word, those who believe in my word, those who put that confidence in me will be able to stand. All right. Why is Jesus telling all this? Because something was going to occur in the future. Jesus knew that. What's going to occur? Go to Matthew chapter 28. When Jesus came out of that grave early that Sunday morning, when he met with his disciples and apostles, the 11 of them, he met with them in Galilee where he had told them to wait on him. When he came from that grave, you know the first thing he told them? Look at verse 18. All authority, all power has been given unto me. Brothers and sisters, the world needs to know right now who has all power. Amen? Amen. You know what's wrong with the religious world today? Is people don't know who has authority. All of the religious authority doesn't rest with the Pope. Amen? Amen. It doesn't rest with preachers. Amen? Amen? It doesn't rest with my mother or your mother. Your feelings are my feelings. Jesus says all authority. That's what he was trying to get those Jewish leaders to understand. I didn't violate the Jewish law. Y'all need to understand, number two, who I am. That's a Mississippi word, y'all. Y'all need to understand. Y'all missed miss, y'all miss that one. Y'all need to understand. You need to understand that I have all authority. And if Jesus has all authority, how much does that leave you? Go to Hebrews chapter 2. In Hebrews chapter 2, the Bible says in verse number 8, the second, the latter part of verse number 8, the Bible says that, the, that God said he left nothing that is not, you see the word nothing? Nothing that is not under the authority of Jesus Christ. When it comes to what you and I must do to be saved, you and I have no say so in it. Preachers have no say so in it. It doesn't matter how many people get together and vote. The Supreme Court has no say so in it. Jesus has all authority. Amen. If I want eternal life, if I want peace, if I want to live in hope, I need to understand who Jesus is. You see, they searched the scriptures, but they didn't understand the scriptures. Jesus didn't violate the Jewish law. Jesus is a man who has all authority. Amen. Why? Because that's what God wants. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Look at verse 22. He's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. He says, truly, Moses say, back in Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, truly, Moses say, God was going to raise up a prophet like unto me. But Moses says, him shall you hear and what? Something. No. A few things. One or two things. When it comes to what you and I need to do to be saved, the Bible says, hear Jesus. You see, we didn't understand that. And those Jewish leaders, they missed it. They searched the scriptures. And you know what today? People are reading the Bible and they're missing what God would have us to do to be saved. You see, you can read the Bible 
and not understand it. And these Jewish leaders, they missed it. They thought they had Jesus when he healed Leroy. Y'all remember his name, his name now? They thought they had Jesus. But Jesus told them, I didn't violate the Jewish law. You all need to understand who I am. I am the person who's going to be given all authority. And because of that, go to Acts chapter 4, look at verse number 12. When Peter preached the sermon, several weeks after the day of Pentecost, notice what Peter says. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there's none of a name, none of a person. That's what he's talking about. There's nobody else on the earth with the authority that Jesus Christ has. What I'm trying to get you to understand right now, Jesus has all religious authority. Amen. And if we want to be saved, if we want eternal life in heaven, we need to be saying, crying, Jesus, what is it that you will have me to do? Not what you're going to feel because your feeling has nothing to do with it. Not what you think because your thinking has nothing to do with it. First John 3, verse 7, it's not he that thinks he's righteous who's righteous. It's not he that feels he's righteous who's righteous. You see, you can feel like you're right. It doesn't make you right. You can think you're right. It doesn't make you right. What makes you right is that you obey what Jesus tells you to do. Because who is he? He's a man with all power, all authority. And with that in mind, notice what John says in 2 John 9. Whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the teaching of Christ has not God. If you don't abide in the doctrine of Christ, you have neither the Father nor the Son. If you want a relationship with God, you need to understand who Jesus is. He's the man that God has given all authority to. And so these Jewish leaders, they need to understand Jesus didn't violate the Jewish law. Second, they need to understand who Jesus is. The third truth that they need to understand, look at verse number 28. Look at verse 28. Here's the third thing that they need to understand. What is coming? And Jesus used an opportunity to tell them what is coming. And paraphrase, he tells them one day, you are each one are going to die. But he says, Lord, or not at this, for the day is coming. When I want you to underline this word, all that are in the grave shall hear my voice and shall come forth. They who have done good to the resurrection of life, but they who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. What are you saying, Jesus? One day, you're going to live again. Each one of you, you Jewish leaders, you're going to die, but you're going to live again. I'll stop by tonight and tell you, one day, each one of you, you're going to die. Brother and sister, you're not like a dog rover when you're dead, it's all over. You're going to live again. Now, I'm not preaching a dog doesn't have a, have a soul. Well, I am, because a dog doesn't have. I don't get to heaven and expect to see Pluto, okay? Well, that's another sermon. But let's get back to John chapter 5. Jesus tells these Jewish leaders, the hour is coming. Yes, you're going to die. But you're going to live again. And one day, you're going to live again because I have all authority. And one day, I'm going to call all those spirits, wherever they are right now, Amen. I'm going to call, and they shall come forth. And so there's going to be a resurrection. Turn to Acts chapter 24. Look at verse number 15. As Paul is standing before Felix, defending himself, he tells Felix something emphatic. And John, in Acts chapter 24, and verse, verse 15, Acts 24, and verse 15, he said, and there shall be, beyond a shadow of doubt, there shall be a resurrection. One day, you're going to live again. My mother's dead, but she's going to live again. Amen. Two years ago, my first wife passed away. I'm on a kind of a honeymoon here. I recently remarried. But my first wife, she's going to live again. My granddad's dead. My grandmother's dead. Everyone who has ever lived yes, sir. and had died going to live again. 
And I'll stop by tonight and tell you, you're going to live again. And knowing that fact that you're going to live again, you need to understand the four truths that I'm going to tell you in just a moment. You're going to live again. That's already been quoted in Hebrews 9, verse 27. It's once appointed unto every man to die. But after that, there's coming a judgment. And brother and sister, you and I, you're going to be at that judgment. You and I will be at that judgment. There's a great day coming. And you and I and everyone who's ever lived, everyone who ever will live, everyone who's ever will be born will be at this judgment, the living in the day. But look at John chapter 5, verse 28. I want you to see something else. Because there's a doctrine flowing through Tennessee that there's going to be two resurrections. I don't know if it's made it down here in Florida yet, but there are religious groups saying that one day, there's going to be a great rapture, and that the righteous are going to go to heaven for a thousand years, and the unrighteous shall remain. They're not going to be resurrected, those who are unrighteous who are dead. They're going to remain in the grave. But that's not what Jesus says. Look at John 5, verse 20. He says, Marvel not at this, for the hour come, and what? Oh, there's no two resurrections. There's only going to be one Resurrection. And when Jesus speaks, all are going to come up. Now, the only difference is, as I already quoted in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16, when that resurrection occurs, the righteous are just going to keep on rising. The righteous who are dead are going to meet the Lord in the air, but the right, but the unrighteous, they shall remain on this earth. There's going to be one resurrection. But the only difference is the righteous will go to meet the Lord in the air. And the unrighteous shall remain on this earth forever and ever. And that's when one day the Lord is going to take his people. And you know the rest of the story. And this place that we call earth will become a flame of fire. But nonetheless, there's only going to be one resurrection. Turn to Revelation chapter 1. Look at verse number 7. Revelation chapter 1. Verse number seven, Jesus says, we come back. He says, behold, John writes, every eye, not just the righteous, but every eye shall see him. Behold, every eye, there's only going to be one resurrection. Then John says in John 5, verse 29, those who are resurrected and they're righteous, they shall be with the Lord. But those who are resurrected and they are unrighteous, they shall experience the condemnation of God. Let me say to you, friends and I, brothers and sisters, don't die outside of Christ. Amen. If you remember the second thing that you need to remember tonight, first is God loves you. Second, don't die outside of Christ. You see, if you die outside of Christ, you're going to be resurrected outside of Christ. And if you're resurrected outside of Christ, John 8, verse 21. John 8, verse 24 equals to a point. When something is repeated in the Bible over and over, God is trying to make a point to us. Jesus said, if you die in your sin, where I am, you can't come. Where's Jesus tonight? He's in heaven. Why are you here tonight? You want to go to heaven. So in order to go to heaven, you've got to get right with God, get right with Christ, and then you got to what? Stay right. Amen. Because if you don't stay right, yes, then the Lord one day is going to take out of the church. Matthew chapter 13, verse 41. Those who have done offenses. Let me tell you something tonight. You already know everybody in the church is not going to heaven. Amen. Amen. It's okay if I say that. Now we just say it. Everybody in the church is not going to heaven. But if you're not in the church, you're sure not going to heaven. Let me prove that. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 17. The Bible says, is that all right? The Bible says for the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of Christ, at the church of Christ. And if it first start at us, the church of Christ, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel? You see, if you're not in the church, the church of Christ, you're sure not lost. But everybody in the church who's not faithful, not going to make it. And so one day, 
You're going to die. But you're going to live again. Why? To face the judgment. And that brings us to the final truth that Jesus shares with these Jewish leaders. Remember the first truth? I didn't violate the Jewish law. Remember the second truth? You need to know who I am. Remember the third truth? One day something is coming. You're going to die, but you live, you're going to live again. Then that brings us to the fourth truth. What will be Jesus' role in the coming judgment? Brothers and sisters, that the great judgment come. But Jesus now takes the opportunity, look at verse 22, to explain to them his role in the judgment. And that's a title that's been given to Jesus' authority in the judgment. What is going to be Jesus' role in the judgment? And Jesus tells these Jewish leaders, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. On the day of judgment, God will sit on the throne, but who's going to be doing the judging? Jesus Christ. Standing on the right hand side of God, Jesus will be doing the judgment. How do I know that? There are verses over and over in the New Testament that prove this point. Turn to Matthew chapter 12 again. I'm Matthew chapter 16. Turn to Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse number 26. Matthew chapter 16. Look at verse number 26. The Bible says, as Matthew tells this in Matthew chapter 6, verse 27, the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he, well, who's he? The Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? Jesus Christ will reward each according to his works. Who's going to be doing the rewarding? Who's going to be doing the judgment? The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 16, verse 27, that Jesus is going to be the judge. And that's what he's telling these Jewish leaders. I will judge you on the day of judgment. You're judging me. You don't even have the authority. But I have the authority. One day I'm going to judge you. Turn to Matthew chapter 25. It's just been talked about. In Matthew chapter 25, look at verse 31 and verse number 32. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 and 32, the Bible says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he, notice, and he will separate. Who's going to separate the righteous from the unrighteous? Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to tell them just a moment why God has given him or will give him this great uh, role in the judgment. But at, right now, I want to establish the fact that on the day of judgment, Jesus will judge you and I. Turn to Acts chapter 10. Look at verse 42. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is talking to the niggas. And notice what he tells the knees in Acts 10 and verse number 42. He said, and he commanded us, talking about Jesus, to preach to the people and to testify that he who ordained, that he was ordained by God to judge of the living, to be the judge of the living and the dead. God has ordained. God has ordained that on the day of judgment that Jesus Christ will judge us. He has all authority right now. That's who he is. And on the day of judgment, he will judge us. One day he's going to speak and everybody's going to come forth. They who have done good to the resurrection of life, but they who have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Jesus will judge, and that's what Peter tells Canadians that God has ordained that Jesus would judge us. Now let's go back to John chapter 5. Look at verse 39 again. John 5, verse 39. Look at it again. Jesus says, you search the scriptures. You, you, you search the scriptures, but you don't get it. You don't get who I am. You don't understand who I am. I am the man with all of the authority right now and on the day of judgment. On the day of judgment, I'll judge you. Because God has ordained that that's what he wants me to do. Turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 
to 2 Timothy chapter 4 and look at verse number 1. As Paul is talking to Timotheus, knowing that shortly he's going to be put to death. Notice what he tells Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4 verse 1. He says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge? Who will judge the Lord Jesus Christ, the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom? And because Jesus is going to one day judge the living and the dead, verse 2, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. For the time is going to come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but Timothy preached the word because the words are the words of Jesus. And what's so important about the word of Jesus? John 12, verse 48. They're going to judge us on the last day. That's why tonight we need to be inquiring who is Jesus? And Jesus, what is it that you will have me to do? Because whosoever transgresses and does not abide in the teaching of the words of Jesus cannot go to heaven. He has all authority right now, and on the day of judgment, he, given by the authority of God, will judge the world. Turn to Romans chapter 2, look at verse number 16. And Romans chapter 2, look at verse number 16. Paul tells the Romans in Romans 2, 16, God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ. Do you see that? Over and over the Bible tells us that Jesus will reign as judge. So what will be Jesus' role in the coming judgment? Jesus will serve as your judge. Are you ready to face the judge? Are you ready? And that's what Jesus wants these Jewish leaders to understand. Turn to Revelation chapter 6. Look at verse number 12. And Revelation chapter 6 and verse number 12. John tells us that one day the sixth seal is going to be open. And he said he was privileged to see the future. He saw that when the sixth seal was open, there was an earthquake. The sun became as blood. The moon became black as sackcloth and ash. The stars began to fall to the earth as a fig casting off for a time of figs. And then he goes on to say the rich men, the chief captain, the mighty men, every bondman, and free men would run to the den till they came to the rocks of their mouth and say, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him, the lamb, because the great day of his wrath has come. One day, those who are not ready to face the judge run and try to see death, but there'll be no dying. Brothers and sisters, one day that's coming to judgment. My question to you tonight, are you ready to face the judge? And those who are not ready to face the judge, they're going to see death, but there'll be no dying. Look at Revelation 6, look at verse 17. And then the question is asked, who will be able to save? When that great day comes, when Jesus called all the dead from the grave and they stand before the mighty throne of God and be judged by Jesus Christ, the question tonight is, who will be able to stand? That's what Jesus tried to get them to understand back in verse number 24. That whosoever believeth, hears my words, and believes my word, whosoever put their trust in me, whosoever obeyed Jesus Christ, will be saved. But if you don't obey Jesus Christ, then you won't be able to stand in the day of judgment. And that's why tonight it is so important that you and I obey Jesus. That's why tonight it is so important that we discover who Jesus is and what is it that Jesus wants us to do. You see, Jesus has the authority to tell us what to do to be saved. Nobody else has the authority to tell us what to do to be saved. And Jesus, because he had the authority to tell us what to do to be saved, he's the one that's going to judge us on the last day. Go to Acts chapter 17. Go to Acts chapter 17, look at verse number 29. As Paul is in the city of Athens, he talks with these men about the unknown God. He tells them about this unknown, this unknown God, how he wants a relationship with them. How he wants them to know him. Why? 
Verse 29. Because God once weak at ignorance. But now he commanded every man, whosoever, every man, everywhere, Jew, Gentile, everywhere to repent, to make a change. Why? Look at verse number 31. Yes, sir. Why? Because he has appointed a day. He has appointed what day? And in which he would judge the world in righteousness by that man. Well, who is that man? Nothing more than the Son of God, Jesus. One day, Jesus is going to judge you. My question tonight, are you ready to face the judge? Are you ready to face the judge? Now, here is the heart of the lesson. Look at verse 27. And in verse number 27, Jesus tells these Jewish leaders something they need to know. And something you and I need to know and never forget. Jesus tells them that the person who's going to judge him on the day of judgment is nothing more than the Son of God. Yes. I want you to remember that phrase, Son of God. Eighty times that phrase is mentioned in the New Testament. Why is there for a point? And that is that Jesus is both God and man. That's the point throughout the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The world needs to know, and these Jewish leaders need to know that Jesus, whom they are now interrogating, he is both man and God. And he is well qualified, because he's man and God, to be the best judge on the day of judgment. You know why? He understands. Did you hear what I just said? Who else the best to judge us? Someone, God, who lived on this earth, who was tempted in all points of life, like as we, yet without sin. And I stand before Jesus. There's no excuse. Amen. He understands. Why, he's in heaven. He's praying to the Father. He's pulling for me tonight. And he's pulling for you. He knows you by name. He's pulling for you. I don't know if there's a Betty in the audience, but Betty, I want you to know tonight that Jesus in heaven saying, God bless you, Betty. Yes, sir. I don't know if there's, a, if there's a bill out there tonight, but Bill, I want you to know that there's somebody in heaven pulling for you. He understands what you're going through. Linda, I want you to know he understands what you're going through. Larry, I want you to know that he understands what you're going through. And Sam, he, I know he understands. He said, Sam wants to please you so much, Father. Father, please continue to bless him. Let's continue to help him. You see, he understands. He was tempted in all parts of life, like as we get with our sin. Hebrews 4 14. We don't have a high priest that doesn't understand what we're going through. Thanks be to God tonight, we have a high priest that understands. And who better? To judge us than Jesus. And brother and sister, on the day of judgment, if we love Jesus, we're going to do what he wants us to do. Amen? Amen. And on the day of judgment, we don't do his will. We'll say, Sammy, I love you. Sammy, I love you. But Sammy, what did you do? I wanted you to spend an eternity with us in heaven. Sammy, why did you do my will? Oh, we want you in heaven, Sammy. I told you that at the beginning. God wants you in heaven. Jesus understands what we're going through in Matthew 4. He was tempted by Satan in all points of life. Satan tried everything. Yes, he did. So that he could become that perfect land that we can live in for of eternal life. Yeah. Who is Jesus Christ tonight? He is the Son of God. He will judge us on the last day. And that brings me to my third and final point. Look at verse 30. And that is to ask you a timely question. Are you ready to face the judge? Yes. And in verse number 30, Jesus tries again. As he comes to an end, of dealing with these Jewish leaders. 
He tries one more time to get them to understand that he didn't violate the Jewish law. Trying to get them to understand who he is and, and what is coming. And he says, I judge. I judge. Who will be able to stand when Jesus judges on the day of judgment? Turn to Revelation chapter 7. In Revelation chapter 7, Look at verse number 9 through verse 14. John says, and again, he was privileged to look into heaven. John said, I saw a number, Sandy, yes, that no man can know. I don't know how many people are going to make it to heaven. Amen. No man knows. Amen. Jesus said, I mean, John says, I saw a number that no man can know. But look at verse 13. And one of the elders said to John, who are these people, John? Who are these people that are going to be qualified to go into heaven? Who are these people who are eligible to go into heaven? John says, I don't know. You tell me. Verse 14. These are they, John, who've gone through great trials and tribulation, John. These are they, John, who've had their lives washed and the blood of the Lamb. These are they who have obeyed Jesus. Who is Jesus? The one with all of the authority. What did Jesus authorize to be preached? Go ye into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth in is baptized might be no, shall be saved. These are they who have been baptized and washed in the blood of the Lamb. And their sins have been washed away. And when your sins are washed away, where can you go? To heaven. Look at verse, look at Revelation chapter 20 as we bring this lesson to a close. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Look at verse number 6. John writes these words, blessed and holy is he. Who's blessed? Who's holy? Is he who had part in what? The first resurrection. But what in the world is the first resurrection? That's baptism. Well, if you have take part in the first resurrection, the baptism where you die in sin and you're buried in the water and grave of baptism and you're resurrected and walk in the newness of life, the second death, what's the second death? Hell can't touch you. Brothers and sisters, that's what Jesus said. That what qualifies you that on that day when all the dead are raised from the grave, and that those who have obeyed my voice will be saved. What must you do? Be resurrected. But what how resurrected from what? A watery grave of baptism. Why? Colossians 2 and verse 12. And the act of baptism, God, not man, God, not the Pope, God, not the preacher, God operates on you. That's it, man. Look at Colossians 2, where God operates. And God only operates in the water. Because that's what Jesus said. And when you go down in the water, God removes sin. And you're resurrected as a new creature in Christ. And then the Lord adds you to the church. But what's so important about the church? That's where the saved people are. Because the Lord placed them there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24. And on the day of judgment, Jesus shall present to the Father, the church, the saved people. Why? Because he has all authority. My question for you tonight is are you ready to face the judge? One day, every one of us in here. Now, just because you're a member of the Lord's church doesn't mean you're saved. My question for you tonight is to examine your life. Because Jesus says, if you continue in my word, amen, then are you my disciple. Tonight, are you ready to face the judge? Tonight, are you ready to face Jesus? You see, Jesus didn't violate the law of Moses. Jesus has all authority. One day, I'm going to die, and I'm going to live again. When I live again, I'm going to face the judge. And what matters tonight, what kind of relationship do I have with the judge? If you have no faith the judge, he doesn't know you. Not everyone that says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. For many shall say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Lord, Lord, did we not do many great works in your name? Jesus says, 
I will confess to them I never knew. This is hard. One day you're going to face this. I'm so thankful that we don't have to go before the judge. We go before the judge with confidence. Not because of anything we've done, but because of what was said earlier, grace and mercy. Because of God's grace, but you've got to come in contact with that grace. And the only way you come in contact with that grace, you've got to obey Jesus. It appeared as available. Titus 2, verse 11. Grace is available to everyone. But in order for you to be recipient of the grace, you've got to obey the gospel of Christ. And when you obey the gospel of Christ, you are eligible to go to heaven. If you continue to walk in sin, then you go away. But if you repent, guess what? God is so great. All oh, is wonderful. That God throws our sins into the sea of forgiveness. And we start like a though we've never sinned again. And that's what John said in Revelation 20, 12. I saw the dead small and great standing in the And a book was opened in another book. One day the book of life is going to be opened. Is your name in the book? Not in Not on your name, but your life. You got deeds in that book that have not been deleted. And your blood will be wrong. Isn't it so wonderful that God loves us so much? That He's provided us an avenue that we can repent. All the things we have done that violates the will of Jesus are just instantly deleted. Isn't it great? That's wonderful. Amen. Even when we get to the day of judgment, we will yeah. be sinners. And that's why God's grace will kick in again. Because of his grace, we'll be able to. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I can't live good enough to go to heaven. I'm on my way to heaven because of God's grace and mercy. Amen. Because I obeyed the gospel. If you haven't obeyed the gospel, God loves you. God can't save you. So what do you need to do tonight? You need to obey the judge. Why? Because this law is going to judge you in the day of judgment. What do you need to do tonight? You know your heart. You know your life. I don't know. I'm going to leave here tomorrow morning. I don't know. I don't know if I'll ever see you again. You don't know if you'll ever see me again. Or would it be great one day we'll be in heaven and talk about tonight. Talk about today. Talk about our time together. All right. We will stand before the judge and hear him say, Lord God. Somebody needs to come to Jesus tonight. Somebody needs to get his life right with Jesus tonight. Is it you? You know your heart, and Jesus knows your heart. What are you going to do? The invitation song has been condemned. Let me give you what you need to be saved. You need to believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ is. You believe it? Those Jewish leaders couldn't believe it. Well, you need to be willing to confess because you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God for this world. If you can confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, he'll confess you on the day of judgment. But if you deny him, he'll deny you. Then you need to be baptized, not because you're already saved, you need to be baptized to be saved. Baptism, 1 Peter 3 21, will wash away your sin. When? You, with a clear understanding, understand what baptism is for. Otherwise, you just get away. You need to understand that baptism is for an act of obedience. It's an act of obedience to the command of Jesus Christ. And those who understand that and go down into a watery grave of baptism, when they come up, they're born again. And if they remain faithful unto death, even when they fall short, they can pass. Yes, sir. Praise of Jesus, just keep so on to the Lord, wash my hands. One day we will stand before Jesus. We don't have to stand with fear. We can wait patiently to hear him say, Well done, Sam. Well done. What will the Lord say to you? What do you need to do tonight? Won't you come as we together, Sam?